This week, I am joined by Dmitry Orlov, who is a Russian engineer and writer whose work is based around collapse, technology and politics. He is the author of multiple books, including Reinventing Collapse, The Soviet Example and American Prospects, and The Five Stages of Collapse, A Survivor's Toolkit. We will be discussing his book, Shrinking the Technosphere. If you wish to support Hermitic's podcast, please find links to our Patreon and merchandise page in the description. Enjoy. Dmitry Orlov, uh, thanks for coming on to uh, the Hermitics podcast. Uh, great to be with you. Um, so, as per this podcast, uh, the first question is the Hermitics question, which is, if you can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation, whom do you pick? Well, um, I'm not a big fan of uh, fantasy sports, but uh, um, I, I suppose one one outstanding question I have is uh, why does everybody believe that democratic institutions are so good when all that ever happens with them is they degenerate into a kleptocracy? And uh, so who would I ask? I, I suppose um, the the original Democrat in my mind is Genghis Khan. He, he was the, the first person who uh, arrived at a democratic structure for the world's largest land empire of all time. Um, so I'd have him along. And then a good practitioner uh, would, um, I suppose, be Niccolo Machiavelli. And um, then I'd ask an American along, Thomas Jefferson. And I would ask them that question. Why does everybody feel that democracy is valuable when all that ever happens uh, with democratic institutions is they swiftly degenerate into a kleptocracy where a tiny minority fleeces the rest. So if we were to stay on that topic, why, why do you personally think that um, people are extremely almost reverent of uh, democracy in general? Well, it's just, uh, I don't know if it, that they're reverent. It's just that uh, the, there is this uh, consensus, it would seem, um, I think it's based on, on on something that Churchill said that um, democracy is the worst system except for all the others, um, and that seems to be a consensus. It's very hard to get anywhere with people by telling them that well, you know, democratic institutions don't really work, so let's try something else. It's just a non-starter. And it's just an observation. It's not okay. something I think. It's something I observe. So a little, a tiny bit about your your biography or your history here um for those that don't know your work um and i think the important aspect is that your the two things i see is making your collapse or yeah your your collapse analysis unique is one that you um you sort of experienced and have written about the experiences of the end of the soviet union in relation to collapse and two in terms of technology you you're not a luddite you're not anti-technology and you're not, you know, kind of hearkening back to some form of um, archaic nostalgia. You uh, you wish to wrestle with technology. These are the two things I see as kind of unique to your viewpoint here. Um, perhaps you could extrapolate just a little about your history, especially in terms of the the Soviet Union. There. Well, I, I was born in Russia. I grew up there. Um, well, Russia didn't exist at the time. That was the Russian. Uh, fe federative Soviet Socialist Republic, um, and I um, I moved to the United States together with my family uh, as a teenager. Um, went through uh, school and and university in in the United States. Worked in the United States. Had several careers, and uh, at the first opportunity, I started going back to to what became Russia. Well, first I went back to the Soviet Union in eighty nine. But in subsequent years, it was uh, I was going back to to Russia, Russian Federation, and uh, during the 90s, I uh, observed the transformation that took place there, and um, that that got me thinking: um, How is the United States different? What I saw um, in the Soviet Union and in Russia was that um, the system that was entrenched and and um, and still functioning was becoming dangerously depleted at every level, starting with uh, being unable to maintain uh, the physical plant and equipment that, that supported the whole thing, to being unable to replace the elites 
that that ran the system with same caliber human material. I started thinking, well, what, how, what, why is why is, has the Soviet Union collapsed, but the United States still hasn't? Um, part of that answer was that the Soviet Union collapsed first, and that gave the United States a new lease on life because what happened in the 90s was wholesale looting of everything that wasn't nailed down in the former Soviet Union. All that wealth went west. It was basically just looted. So that was one of the reasons for the postponement. There, there, there were several others. But generally, I started looking at the Soviet template and applying it or trying to apply it to the United States and uh, the West in general, um, but mostly to the United States. And, and it turned out that um, the Soviet Union was inadvertently much better prepared for collapse than the United States is or ever will be. And that collapse, when it comes in the United States, will be far more destructive than what happened in the Soviet Union or in Russia. And I believe I'm, I'm correct in thinking that, and this is one of the things you um, you make clear in reinventing collapse that that the reasons uh, the Soviet Union was better was was far more prepared for collapse was because the 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 population there already almost had to deal with collapse anyway. Hardly anyone was making ends meet, so they had to. Um, they had to find these skills and, and, and teach themselves these skills not as kind of additional extras like they would be currently in the US, but literally because they had to live. So as as John Michael Greer, you know, he calls it the long descent. The Amer- America is within the long descent, but it's just kind of just about holding itself up and not recognising its the, the, the problems there. Whereas like, do, you, do you think the people in Russia kind of knew like this, this is coming to an end? Well, um, there, there were... There, there are differences. Well, first of all, the, the positives that uh, Russia had with regard to collapse was that it could collapse without hurting the, the systems very much that kept people alive. So even without a running economy, because it was um, a command and control economy rather than a market economy, uh, people still had uh, electricity, they still had running water, they, there was still heat in the houses, public transportation kept running. Um, there was still some kind of food in the stores, although uh, you know that that part of the system collapsed relatively quickly. But there were stock stockpiles still. Uh, some parts of agriculture agriculture kept running, so you could still get staples. Uh, there was free medical care, even though uh, access to uh, pharmaceuticals uh, wasn't very good at various times. But people still could get their their bones set, and and uh, you know infants were delivered without anybody having to pay for it. And so those were all benefits that the United States does not have. Uh, in the United States, if you run out of money, you're pretty much just out on the street digging through garbage. There was some of that happening in Russia, but not as much, uh, at the worst of times, not as much as is happening routinely in the United States today. The hom- homelessness crisis, crisis just didn't really hit Russia at all. It's rampant in the US already, even pre-collapse. And then the other huge benefit that Russia had was a, a very highly educated populace that w- turned out to be extremely resourceful. When, once they realized that they had to start doing things very differently and shifting for themselves, they did start shifting for themselves. It didn't, it didn't help matters that the government was just incredibly corrupt and, and surrendered its, its sovereignty to, to the United States mostly, the European Union to some extent. But they clawed it back uh, under Putin, and and so uh, now you have a good combination of, you know, well-educated people basically managing their own affairs rather well within a market economy this time, uh, without a lot of dependence on on outside forces. Perhaps I'm being a bit stereotypical towards the ideology of um, Soviet Union here, but do you find there's a, a little bit of an irony there that um, against the communist ideology that people had to go, uh, had to become actually very almost individualist? Or was there still a form of community there that was separate from the ideology? Well, individualism still doesn't get you very far in Russia on a social level. Um, People still do depend on each other here uh, to a great extent. And and the traditions of solidarity uh, do appear to hold in a lot of cases. And, And, you know, that's very helpful. As far as the communist ideology, uh, that died 
uh, sometime during World War II, I think. <laughs> anyway, you know, basically, you know, once once Lenin was dead and 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 uh, and and Trotsky was in exile and and then dead, uh, you were left with Stalin, and Stalin was not a, really a communist. I don't I don't know if anybody really appreciates that, but he he used capitalist methods to achieve. Uh, you know, socialist victories. None of that had to do with communism. And uh, only after Stalin died did some of that came back because uh, of, of these quote-unquote Ukrainians that went into power, which was Khrushchev and then Brezhnev. Um, and th they, they started talking up, you know, um, international duty. So the reason the Soviet Union blundered into Afghanistan was to preserve world revolution in some sense and um, you know that that was just the system kind of degenerating but but the, the 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 public understanding was that the ideology was just this tired old bunch of stuff that people were forced to study and repeat there was no life to it okay okay do you think that the anywhere in the world um, since um, Lenin and Trotsky there has been uh, a legitimate kind of communist ideology which people are supportive of as a nation? Well, Cuba made a try of it, but Cuba is really just socialism with with market elements. I mean, that's that's the only system that works in the world, anywhere in the world, is socialism with market elements. Is that that's what you, all could, there is. Is that what you'd consider America then, socialism with market elements? It's incredibly corrupt socialism with mar incredibly corrupt market elements, yes. But it's basically America is unique in that it's it's gen generally just eating itself alive. You know, it's it's a bunch of rackets, as as Kunstler likes to put it, and I agree with him. America at this point is just a bunch of rackets. Okay, um, I'm sure we'll we'll dip back into a few of those political things there, but um, just to just to begin on the the kind of collapse and the technology front, uh, and I'm sure you've you've answered this question quite a few times now. Um, a few of the discussions I've listened to, but if I could just ask you it. Um, a kind of a brief definition of uh, what it is that you entitled the technosphere. Well, um, I I wrote that book a while ago. It it did um, rather badly commercially um, for a couple of different reasons. One is um, that I published it just as uh, Trump got elected, mm -hmm. and um, in the book I I failed to uh, demonize Trump. Uh, which made me unpopular with uh, the "quote unquote" liberal <laughs> readership, which was quite a quite a large percentage of it. So a lot of people, you know, bought the book, found out that I was saying positive things about Russia as opposed to claiming that Russia stole the election or some stupid thing like that, and returned it. So it didn't really get very far. And the other thing is that uh, in the book, I expect people to consider changing what they do. Actually, you know, I expected people to do some work, and that that's really not a not a winning move. Expecting people to do something is generally a bad idea. Uh, expecting people to do less is generally a big winner. Any great idea that allows you to just sit there and do nothing is going to be popular. Um, so on those two fronts, it really didn't do well, but. I, I sort of stuck with the subject and, and explored it some more, and um, sometime later I discovered a great Russian thinker by the name of Lev Gumilov, who um, did a lot of research along these lines. It turns out uh, turn, turns out that uh, the term technosphere was was coined early in the 20th century by another great Russian thinker by the name of Vernadsky, a scientist who was the instigator of the Russian, not Soviet, but Russian pre-revolutionary uh, nuclear research program. It was th thanks to him that when uh, uh, the Soviet Union became threatened with American nuclear bombs, uh, they, they could come up with their own nuclear bombs in record time because they already had a program running. They already had stockpiles of material, etc. But anyway, he came up with the term technosphere and, and then Gumilov expanded on it and came up with this triad, which is we have the biosphere of the Earth, all of the living things within within it. And then we have uh, a sort of emergent 
uh, entity within the biosphere, which is humanity, but not of the sort of humanity that, that sleeps on bare ground naked and digs around for tubers with a stick, but humanity that, you know, creates, builds pyramids and creates empires and, and conquers the world and, and invents sailing ships and all, all of this other stuff. And it turns out that there's a process that gives rise to communities of people who are capable of more than just their survival. He, he called the process ethnogenesis and had a lot to say on the subject by looking at all of the examples of ethnogenesis from the last 6,000 years or so. And then the technosphere is what ethnogenesis creates. Uh, it is the, uh, the universe of man-made things, which is unlike the biosphere, all it ever does is degenerate. You build it and it falls apart. You build it again and it falls apart. And, and we're in kind of the late stages of the technosphere now where it is very highly developed and you can't tell whether it's being built or whether it's falling apart. Competi competencies are going missing left and right, while new competencies, such as making smartphones even smarter, are zooming ahead for what that's worth. So it's very interesting to, to look at the world uh, through that prism as, as, that, as that triad and, and examine the various facets of it. So what would you say the, the difference there then, because you say that the, the technosphere only degenerates, what would you say the difference with regards to entropy would be between the biosphere and the technosphere? Well, the biosphere um, basically is all based on flows, energy flows that, that are driven by solar energy and some chemical energy, but mostly just solar energy. So it can achieve steady state for long durations, and it's also self-adjusting. So uh, as, as the climate shifts, certain species do worse, and you know, other species go extinct and some, something else evolves. And, and it, it doesn't really involve a lot of, uh, or any human intervention. Whereas the technosphere, if it's not being maintained, it really falls apart. Every last bit of it. You know, even the pyramids are slowly being weathered away, um, even though they were meant to last forever, but nothing that humans build can last forever. It's all temporary because it's all based on the technosphere. And and you, you say in, in, in your book that this uh, the technosphere is, a, is a, not only a demon, but you specifically allude to it being a demiurge. And I really enjoyed this turn of phrase. Um, was there a specific reason you called it a demiurge? I basically try to appeal to the sensibilities of people who, who can't think of an emergent system because that doesn't mean anything to them. So um, a lot of people are more comfortable thinking in terms of uh, a demonic entity or a spirit than just a mechanism that is so advanced and complicated that it it, it shows, um, it, it demonstrates uh, some some limited ability to to reason and and actually manifests its own will and can formulate its own agenda. That's that's a stretch for a lot of people. So I use those terms more as a crutch than anything else. Okay, so um, in 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 kind of uh, specific scientific terms, it would be an emergent system. It's Are an you, emergent system. Okay. Are you um, sympathetic to? the spiritual views or are you spiritual at all well yes uh i think that uh that that entire realm is you know extremely important and completely unrelated to the subject matter so the the teleology of the technosphere it's um end game it's the point that it's kind of grasping towards in the future um you say this is is control um and i think we can say that that's the technosphere's aims unto itself, um, but can this really be answered to us? Do you think? Do you, can we? Can we truly say that the what the what the teleology for the technosphere for itself is, or are we would would that just be conjecture? Well, it's it's a sort of can, imagine it as as a robot or a, a, an artificial intelligence network. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have taste or touch or human sight. It it has certain analytical tools it can perform certain measurements right it can take a photograph and then distill certain elements from it it can use face re facial recognition or it can it can map lines or contours on 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 a 
photograph, aerial photograph or satellite photo and derive from it a map. It, it, most, it has access to a great deal of statistical data, so it can perform various types of analysis. But that is all it can do. Uh, it doesn't have any human sensibility. It doesn't have any, any sort of uh, instinct or uh, any emotional intelligence. And so what it can do is it can control various processes that are within its control. It can, for instance, um, allow or deny access to credit. That's one of the functions that it is generally absorbing into itself because uh, it's much better than human analysts. And, and there are various other functions that it can perform, but all of them are based on this idea of complete control based on incomplete information because nobody ever has access to complete information. And that is its undoing, I think. Uh, it, it tries to control things more and more tightly and in the process, it destroys whatever it is it tries to control because it doesn't have access to complete information. And this is the one of the one of the things you really emphasize in in, in the book that um, the reason the technosphere and specifically humans kind of almost don't get along, or at least the technosphere doesn't get along with the humans, is because the technosphere adores standardization and humans in general, at least uh, before being kind of assimilated into the technosphere. Uh, are spontaneous and intuitive and um, free in a certain way, at least when they're children. And um, so this is this is one of the things you say that the technosphere does from 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 the off, you know, from from day one, really, is find ways to standardize existence. Well, not all standardization is bad. For instance, if you if you have uh, standard glass containers for uh, dairy products that you uh, wash yourself and and bring to to the shops empty and they're filled by placing them on the scale and measuring out whatever it is you want to buy then you don't have to uh, deal with recycling a huge number of plastic and paper containers so that's a victory uh, on the other hand if uh, if uh, what's being standardized is human brains children's brains by forcing them to study for standardized tests okay Mm -hmm. that that is definitely bad because who needs standardized brains we need the opposite of standardized brains so it's a question of who's in charge you know if if you have basically an out of control market economy where uh, either you go with the flow or you go broke and then the technosphere is basically in charge you defy the technosphere and you go bankrupt whereas uh, if the economy is is really controlled using uh, an agenda that is based on uh, the production of public goods and on an appreciation of what the common good is, uh, where the profit motive is forced to take a back seat, then the technosphere is not in charge. Humanity is in charge, and humanity makes use of the technosphere. It's a question of who is riding whom, you see. Do we allow the technosphere to ride us, or do we ride it? And uh, there's, there's, well, there's, there's hundreds of clear ways now where it's running us, and I mean, uh, ruining our neuroplasticity from day one and molding us into kind of uh, attention-drained uh, automatons. But one of the one of the really important things I think that's happening that that's being overlooked, especially uh, uh, at least from my personal opinion, in terms of meaning and purpose, is that against standardization, death. And especially suffering almost just can't exist. They're not allowed to exist, at least from the technosphere's point of view. These are nonsensical points of contention. Um, and do you, do you think, uh, as a way to kind of almost push back, or sh uh, as you say, shrink the technosphere, we should we should begin to form again a a more realist understanding of suffering and death. Well, that that is a, a question of culture. And uh, um, I, I think the West, the U.S. and, and uh, the U.K. and probably a lot of Western Europe has gone very far in the direction of uh, sort of putting everyone in hospice care, even while they're still relatively healthy. <laughs> sort of, you know, keep everyone um, sedated so mm -hmm. they do, they don't struggle because there's nothing to, for them to look forward to. So you might as well just hand out drugs and whatever. And, and make sure that nobody is offended with anything or forced to think because uh, thought is so painful, you know, unless you, you, you think a lot, 
when when you're forced to think about something when especially when you're forced to consider two contradictory notions at the same time my god for unpracticed people that just makes their heads explode so don't do that you know just keep everyone comfortable and sedated until it's all over that seems to be the approach but that's not how the rest of the world functions there are large parts of the world where thinking is come just completely forgotten i think there, there are a lot of places in the world where you're just basically repeating what everyone else says or you're in trouble automatically and then there are other places in the world that are renowned for tolerance of just every kind of thinking where there's no internal censorship whatsoever and that can be good or bad but that's what i prefer i'm gonna ask which places do you think are um do you see as as those places who are uh, that are completely tolerant of of of, of any opinion or, or internal thought uh russia is definitely one of those places these days it's extreme in terms of its embrace of freedom of speech you can get away with anything in russia except libel and incitement of violence why do you think that is uh because uh it would be far more expensive to repress than to simply allow and the government has enough on its plate that it's just not going to bother and uh so the would you say that the means that other countries i mean i'm thinking specifically of the uk and uh, america here that the, the the means in which they're suppressing thought it's kind of almost twofold. It seems to me that liberal politics definitely plays a part and also just tech in terms of things like streaming services, binge-watching TV, smartphone addiction. These are kind of um, secondary causes which are almost weren't intended to do this but have ended up doing it through their um, addiction-based design mechanisms. Do you think those two, especially the, I'd, I'd like to hear your comments on the on the the. The, the 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 liberal politics of the UK and the US and the West in general now and the way where you see that heading. Well, um, I I think it's it's a mess, but I could separate a few pieces out of it. One is, as I mentioned, the idea that you know, of hospice care for for the entire society, where everybody has to be sedated and comfortable because they have nothing to look forward to, um, and uh, so their freedom of speech is repressed because you are not allowed to say things that make people uncomfortable, that cause cognitive dissonance and uh, force people to think. Mm -hmm. It's almost illegal to force people to think in the West, it seems. Um, uh, another is that these governments, the US and the UK especially, and the, the entire kind of CIA-controlled echo chamber that is Western media, uh, have been lying continuously about a great number of important things. And so uh, the way they, uh, uh, they, they make sure that they can continue to lie and that they're not found out as complete and utter liars is to suppress every other kind of message and, and to uh, label those who disagree with them as, as the enemy or, or conspiracy theorists or simply Russians. Yeah, that, that's becoming increasingly popular. Well, the reason you're saying that is because you're Russian. That seems to be a typical approach these days. So they have to do that. And then, you know, another reason that people in the West have to absolutely keep their mouths shut is because they've been stuck in an explosive situation where if they speak their minds, uh, the result will be utter social chaos. Uh, and the problem there is that in the West, people have been increasingly herded together with people from incompatible cultures, incompatible on an, uh, an organic level. they It's not that they don't want to get along. It's not that they've been brought up wrong so they can't get along. It's that they never will. They're like different animals of different species that don't mix. And that is not a message that, that can be allowed to get out because the result will be social explosion. So anyone who voices the idea that certain people are not compatible with certain other people in the world, which is a very obvious point, you know, is, is met with a, a great deal of, of derision and, and uh, anybody who espouses those ideas runs the risk of uh, being labeled as, you know, whatever people like to call as, you know, calling names fascist or racist or uh, whatever else, right wing, populist, you know, there's a long list of derogatory terms that is deployed. And this um, 
ties in with actually your latest book, which I which I read, and and uh, I was quite taken taken aback by um, everything. Everything is going according to plan, and um, so just just to spring off the title there, uh, and this is something you do explain in the book. That there's this um, you see that there's a underlying can I can I say agenda to all of this? Would that be correct? Yes, it's a it it, it is an unmistakable sort of a drift to to what's happening um and uh, i don't i don't know that any human uh thinking intelligently as a free agent set that agenda or had anything to do with it it's just a, it seems like more of a trap that everybody everybody is automatically falling into if i was to be extremely speculative could we say that the the, the trap we've fallen into is almost being set by um almost like a pseudo conscious te- technosphere Yes, we could say that. I don't know. Well, c- consciousness is is difficult to you know difficult to measure how conscious someone is, uh, but you you can definitely see uh, will within it. It it it's it it's clear what it wants to do. So um, you know, it, as people are replaced with robots, we need fewer people. Uh, to have fewer people, we have to convince people that the planet is overpopulated and they shouldn't have children. You know that that's logical, because mm-hmm. we have robots. We don't need people, and there are a lot of thought processes like that that sort of short circuits any moral argument you might you might have in favor of a much more simple argument that is purely organizational, purely technical. Um, just to stay on the technosphere here as well. Um, I don't know if you're you're familiar with um, accelerationist thought, um, but as as one of your kind of primary focuses is political, I would like to see what you make of it. So, the idea that uh, the only way out of this is through that we should accelerate the process of techno economic expansion, and just just to quickly um, overview the three major currents. So, left wing accelerationism is to go towards automation and uh, emancipation of man via technology. Uh, right wing is towards a, uh, a singularity and uh, unconditional is just to let it do do what it's doing and just see what happens. But each one of them uh, wishes to accelerate it for its own aims. Do you, would you think this um, callous or do you think there's something in this, especially against kind of older methods of reversion or revolution? Well, uh, what... What disgusts me about both of them is that they use the word we uh, gratuitously, and they they tend to use the word must as well. So uh, who the hell are they to tell everyone what to do? That's that, my first question. That, that, may, be, uh, that may be me uh, just explaining it in a kind of relaxed overview. Um, no, 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 it's, it, no, but th- you, they, they always say things like we must. We meaning everyone, all humans on the planet, uh, and must in terms of uh, them telling everyone what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, at least, you know, intimating that their idea is very important and we should listen to it. And my approach is uh, there is no we, there's you, whoever you are, which is different from who I am. And your opinion is not really important to me, necessarily. You're just in some institution somewhere talking to people like you uh leave the rest of the planet alone and uh my feeling is that there are a lot of different civilizations or lack of civilization on this planet and and they will go their separate ways and one of the biggest problems with the world is that they're all being herded in the same direction right now and that is just not going to work at all but in in terms of where different countries are going um there is a gradual breakdown having to do with the quality of energy that's ongoing, and it, it's been happening for a while now. Um, it's it's really a technical issue. The energy returned on energy invested um, in in the energy that sources that drive the entire economy has been falling continuously. Whatever replacements people are coming up with uh, are worse. So you know, core and ethanol is just absolutely horrible. Uh, windmills and, and, and solar panels are a little bit better, but still bad. Mm-hmm. Um, everything else is, is just so slowly dwindling, except maybe for natural gas in certain areas. And because of that, a lot of economies are shrinking. So the Italian economy, as an example, has uh, 
I think, gone down 25% so far this century. There's overall economic shrinkage as the energy industry eats up more than its previous share. Uh, eventually, it'll just eat up all that's left. And and uh, so that's happening. So that'll that'll result in some countries being energy rich and some countries being energy poor. And and you can definitely see those shifts happening today. You know, people are not really adjusting to the situation. They they think in 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 sort of uh, 20th century terms, even though we're pretty far into the 21st century. So they they still think, for example, in the West, they still think that Russia absolutely must export oil and natural gas because what else could they possibly export? And it turns out that Russia doesn't really need uh, energy exports anymore to maintain a positive trade balance with the rest of the world. Isn't that a shock? <laughs> They don't have to sell you oil and natural gas. They only do it because they like you, you know, um, sort of. Uh, <laughs> question is why. Um, but but there are shifts like that happening that are breaking the planet into clusters, technology clusters or lack of technology clusters. The U.S. is quickly becoming a lack of technology cluster. You know, it's, it's becoming incredibly challenged in all sorts of areas. It can't rearm itself without the help from China. You know, China is the only place where they can buy the machine tools so that they can make rockets to point back at China. There are a lot of lots of examples like that. But I don't think that any sort of uh, techno triumphalist stands a chance because they have to think of uh, what part of the world they're going to appeal to, because there's no one world anymore. There won't be. It's over. This kind of slides in, not being one word, so that, 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 that's pushing us into, uh, as you say, these separate areas of, of um, technology in, in different areas of the world. Um, but a, bit, a, big, a big question is, is within that, uh, especially within the future, and it's uh, a big question in, in a lot of your work, is, um, is freedom. And of course, as we've mentioned with the technosphere, Freedom is already completely obscured um, under layers and layers of uh, technological crap. You know, a good example that you give is the classic kind of um, the freedom to own your car, but everyone says it's so freeing, but really no one thinks about the freedom. Is really the freedom to pay upkeep, commute to work, potentially get in a car crash, etc., uh, etc. Et the um, the downsides to technology are never are never brought to the fore ever. It's always New technology is good. More technology is good. Uh, old technology is bad, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, from this kind of new freedom that we've got, where your freedom is basically based around uh, latching yourself to the latest, uh, in quotation marks, innovation, it, where can we still find, um, dare I say, an authentic freedom? Is 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 that possible? It is possible. Uh, it is very difficult. It's it's a, it's a challenge that I've tackled in my own life. You see, I, I'm an engineer by, mm -hmm. by trading. I've had a, a several careers in, in high tech. And at some point, um, I decided to uh, open up with these ideas that I've had for a long time, for over a decade, and start writing. And so I started a, a blog, and I, I started uh, writing books. And then I found out that uh, my career prospects in terms of engineering uh, were becoming complicated by the fact that people wouldn't hire me based on uh, my writing things that they didn't necessarily think would be agreeable agreeable to their various corporate stakeholders. That I would not be a sort of person that they would want around mm -hmm. because uh, I might make people think about things other than uh, next quarter's profitability. Hmm. Uh, and that's bad. Okay, so uh, for a while there, you know, I I, uh, I I had to find new ways to to sort of get around those limitations, and uh, I I I did find ways. But you, the moment you start trying to jump out of the mainstream and and do and exercise your freedom, as it were, become free. Uh, not just repeat whatever is saying and you know not agreeably when you listen to absolute nonsense uh, as you have to 
the moment you do that, you, you marginalize yourself socially. Not a lot of people are able to deal with the stress, and not a lot of families can put up with members who go through that process. And not everybody can emerge on the other end with uh, a new living arrangement, new new set of uh, you know patterns to live by that that is agreeable to them and that makes them happy. It, so those are the limitations of freedom. You know, either you stay locked in the cabinet or you, you escape. But once you escape, then you know nobody is going to be st- you know replenishing the cookie jar in the cabinet for you automatically mm-hmm. so in, in what ways do you feel you, you found freedom because I, I understand you, um, you you'd live on a you live on a boat well I, I made a number of changes one is uh, I made a number of changes first was uh, I just quit the corporate work altogether um, I, I I did various gigs but you know that that's kind of different than having a position uh, so that's kind of a step down and then I got rid of that too um, then I um, I decided that you know uh, the, the hugest drain on people in probably in you know in, in the U- in the UK and in the United States and in much of the West is paying rent. People spend absolutely exorbitant amounts of money, most of their income, just on rent. And so I cut that out uh, by buying a boat and, and uh, moving aboard with my my wife. Then I found out that you know we we liked sailing and wanted to go sailing, but sailing is incompatible with uh, any kind of a work schedule at all, hmm. because the wind doesn't keep to a schedule. And uh, so you want to go sailing when the wind is good, and uh, uh, we'll work on um, you know calm, rainy days. And and so I, I adjusted to that and went sailing. And then we found out that spending uh, w- winters up north is a bad idea, so we started spending winters in the tropics. And then later on, I, I discovered that you know, with all of the ability these days to do stuff via the internet, just just about everything can be done via the internet. Nobody has to show up anywhere anymore, in person. That there is no reason to <clears throat> stay in the West at all. So uh, now we don't really spend a lot of time anywhere in the West at all. It's just we're just leaving that whole thing behind. You know, we we're, we still have various, you know, re- relationships, personal, work-related, et cetera, uh, that, that tie us to the United States, et cetera. But we don't have to spend much time there at all. And do you think that people, because everyone goes on about wanting to be free, wanting to uh, escape is the classic one. Do you think people truly believe this or is... Are, are people are people apathetic or are they ig- ignorant or even knowingly ignorant of their um, of the trap they've been caught in? Well, a lot. I, don't, I think a lot of people just aren't really capable of making any dramatic changes in their lives because all all their lives have been directed towards forming habits. You know, some habits are good, like you know, doing your homework. <clears throat> Some habits are, are bad, like you know, going out drinking beer, but they're all habits. So if you're a creature of habit, you can't really do anything radical with your life. Some people are, you know, their their entire character is some combination of their various vices. You know, if if you rid them of their vices, what would be left? Just some very boring entity. Um, so if we just um, dip back into uh, the technology discussion, um, as I said before, your 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 unique position is that you want to wrestle with technology and you want to draw it back to um, to a point of almost the point where where each and every bit of technology has a has a purpose, uh, and, and we kind of go through it almost. Uh, perhaps this is the wrong word, but in a, in a conservative manner. Um, where do you draw the line between gratuitous tech, which is you know just a shiny trinket, uh, and legitimate innovation? Because we always hear that word innovation, and people hold up iPhones to kind of try make some point about us progressing. But where is the line where you go? You know what? This is legitimately uh, needed and useful. Well, uh, I think that there is a standard to go by. Um, see, there is this uh, post postmodernist take on reality which is uh, everything is uh, is a narrative and an opinion and everything is virtualized uh, everything is just a message uh, everything is based on appearance 
And, and so uh, all of the innovations that we've had so far, the virtualization of various things, uh, electronic this and, and, and network that, and yeah. all of those sorts of things um, basically aren't real on a fundamental level. They're, they're uh, basically, uh, they're, they exist until the battery dies. Uh, after that, they don't exist anymore. It's amazing what happens in a blackout, not just various devices run out of juice and wink out, uh, or the network goes down, but people's brains go down. People lose their minds. It's It's got gotten to that point. So that's how you tell that you've gone in the wrong direction with the technosphere. If, if the power goes out and people lose their minds and society falls apart, okay, well, that all of that is not worth preserving. Whereas if the power goes out and you just means you go, you go out back and start the generator, and everything's everything's back in order. You know that's kind of a stopgap because there you are until the gasoline or the diesel runs out. Um, you can improve on that quite a bit by being relatively independent of that sort of uh, um, you know tightly organized system, making it more autonomous. So power goes out. Well, you still have uh, wood. Uh, you still have a wood stove. There are still potatoes growing out back, and life goes on. You have books to read. Uh, life can be a lot, a lot simpler. But in addition to that simple life, you can have major advancements. You can have good medical care. You can, you can have uh, good education. You can have all the trimmings without the dependence. And I think that's what people should strive for. Is that? That we 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 can have the option to uh, pick and choose. You don't have to have everything that that since I don't know. I think Greer says from the seventies onwards is really the the time period that we're dealing with when we start talking about um, collapse and the long emergency. That's the Reagan Reagan era onwards seems to be the point where it really pushed into high gear. You can have parts of that, but you don't have to have all the uh, the excess that came with it. So do, what do you, this this era, which I, I don't know if you'd agree, kind of started in the 70s and will probably start to peter out, um, let's say, 2040, 2050, or at least we'll start seeing very, very clear signs, uh, clearer than the ones we're getting now, which is still pretty clear for those uh, that are looking. Uh, what do you think, uh, and obviously this is quite vague, but the next 10 to 30 years um, will will look like for us? Uh, I think it'll be different in different places. So if, if you look at, I don't know, San Francisco, mm -hmm. uh, which is full of kind of drugged out zombies, well, there'll probably be even more drugged out zombies, right? That's the trend. And if you look at, uh, I don't know, um, Shanghai, well, they're putting up high rise buildings and, and uh, becoming ever more prosperous and, and, and rich. So I, I guess that's going to continue to be the trend. And if you, if you look at, at the Congo, well, that's going to probably have more Ebola outbreaks and various plagues, et cetera, and that, that will be the trend there. So you, you, you will have to look at each place in the world, and, and not, not in general terms, but uh, in case you want to go there, you will have to evaluate it based on what it is and, and based on what it is to you because people have uh, limited options in terms of where they can fit in and blend in and become compatible. You briefly mentioned uh, rent earlier, and I think um, we'll kind of finish on this, uh, just this final little discussion here about your, this is your, I believe, an ongoing project, and it's your kind of current project, um, Quidnon, uh, which is mm -hmm. um, a kind of yes. a, a houseboat. Um, yeah, we've, we've had... Um, yes, it's a, it's basically a kit boat that I've been working on for a number of years with several other people. And uh, at various points, people got excited about it, but um, there, there have been some delays. And now it's at a point where I think we, we, are, we actually can see when we're going to produce a set of plans that we can build a full-scale boat from. Mm -hmm. So far, we've been only working with models. But basically, it's an extremely durable, low maintenance, cheap place to live autonomously, uh, could be at a marina in the center of town, or, or it could be in a, just a completely wild place. Um, 
it's it's it can handle the ocean it can handle rivers and canals it's roomy enough so that a family can live aboard and now that young people in various cities in in the US are paying upwards of a thousand dollars a month for a bunk bed mm-hmm. you know that it, it it actually will offer a very good alternative for a lot of people so that they can save up money and escape instead of squandering it all on rent you you say that it will allow people to be autonomous I mean how far will it allow that will it allow certain elements of self-sufficiency as well well yes because uh, we've we've thought very hard about uh, how to heat it how to cool it how to pl- supply it with drinking water how, how to make it move using the wind so that it's not entirely dependent on, on gasoline, how it could generate electricity by itself. Various aspects like that have been taken care of. So it can actually be uh, you know, a pad in the center of town at a marina where you just sleep and, and save money on rent. Or it could be a sort of summer production platform where you go up, up a river somewhere and, and uh, grow food or gather food or fish or hunt and uh, uh, preserve all of that food and bring it back with you. You know, there, there are a lot of options with, in terms of what the use one can put this vessel to. Can it, it can even be used as a, a floating clinic uh, so that uh, medical and dental services can be delivered to remote areas. Uh, there's just no, no limit to what people could do with it. And it's all basically, it's, it's a kit. Some parts are plasma cut and welded using expensive and and advanced techniques and uh, much of the rest of it is basically just uh, something that any uh, amateur builder can handle. In fact, somebody who can assemble IKEA furniture is pretty far along in terms of be- being able to build this boat. Do you, do you see the sea as a uh, the sea and generally river, rivers in general as a as an entirely underutilized uh, source of both living and uh, you know well existence really? Well, um, I think uh, we're, we're, what we're seeing is uh, almost a doubling of, of the amount of, um, of precipitation in a lot of places. We see record flooding in a great number of areas. Ocean levels are pre- predicted to rise, not everywhere on the planet, because uh, also the ocean currents are becoming reconfigured. But in a lot of places where people live along the coast, they're, they're going to be swamped. And so living aboard a boat that can float up when there is a flood and settle down again uh, when when the waters recede is an incredible life hack. It's just so, so much better than living in a house that's just going to flood and become ruined. And then you, what do you do? Build a new house? Well, you're going to run out of money pretty quickly doing that. So living aboard a boat that is on land, but on land that is no longer quite habitable in the usual way, is an option that will be available and will be the only option available to a great number of people in the coming decades. In fact, you know that'll be, that will be their only choice. So when the waters recede, they'll, uh, they'll get around by bicycle. And when, when, when there's a flood, uh, they'll uh, get around by boat, um, you know, paddle around. And that's the way people will live. Um, they, they will have an autonomous source of uh, drinking water from, from rain, from gathering rainwater. There'll be a lot, lots of driftwood they could, they could burn for heat and for cooking. Uh, and, and this boat design takes all of that into account. Okay. So when do you think uh, Quidnon will be um, ready? I don't know. I will do what I can as quickly as I can. And we're probably looking at a couple of years before we have some number of quidnons floating around in various parts of the world. But I've, I've had people express serious interest in, in this design from, from many parts of the world, um, uh, many parts of the U.S., U.K., New Zealand, Australia, Poland, uh, Holland, Russia. Hmm. And, and so I think, I think it's, it's going to be an interesting project. Okay. Um- Final question here, as I've um, I've asked both uh, John Michael Greer and James Kunstler this, uh, you know, two other collapse uh, collapse experts, so to speak. Um, what 
advice would you have for uh, specifically younger generations uh, who are maybe a bit more clued up? Um, things they can be doing uh, heading into the future to be a little bit more prepared. It's all about skills uh, and, and not skills that have to do with sitting in front of a computer, but skills in terms of dealing with people and things you can do with your hands using tools you own. So that's what they should concentrate on. And this is uh, anything you'd, you'd like to uh, add or talk about that we've uh, we've missed, uh, then I think uh, it's a good place to finish. Well, uh, my book, uh, The Five Stages of Collapse, is finally coming out in Swedish. Okay. I'm happy to announce. Uh, it's been many, many years. Uh, politics in Sweden have, have, has advanced to the point where my work is, is now acceptable to the general <laughs> reading public there. So uh, that gives me great joy. Any Swedish Swedish listeners, uh, all of five stages of collapse is now now available. Yeah, it, it's not yet, but it will. Oh, be okay, soon. we'll be soon. From we'll Carnival. be soon. Okay, yes. uh, thanks very much for uh, coming on. Thank you.